Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur. My name is Sean Walchef, founder of Cali Barbecue Media. In life, in the restaurant business, and in the new creator economy, we learn through lessons and stories. Today, we are coming to you live from the JW Marriott in Austin, Texas at the Restaurant Transformation Festival hosted by Restaurant 365. Sold out event, two day event. What I can take away is that the restaurant industry is yearning for more education, it's yearning for more connections, and it's yearning for an ability to ask other operators, other people that are in the digital hospitality space, how can we improve? Very grateful to Toast, our primary title sponsor for this show, for letting us tell stories in the hospitality business, and very grateful to our guest today, Tony Smith, CEO, co-founder of Restaurant 365. Tony, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Sean. I Every time our paths cross, I love it. So it, I'm looking forward to today. Well, I'm very excited because the last time we've seen each other for the last two years, but the first time that I met you was at the National Restaurant Association show in Chicago two years ago. And that's when I first really learned about the vision. I learned about the mission. I learned about the people, about Restaurant 365. Let our audience know who you are and what you do. Yeah. So we are restaurant enterprise management platform, software, right? We do accounting, store operations, workforce, as much as we can to help them manage the store in one spot. Our passion is to help restaurants thrive. We love good food and we want to make them as successful as possible so we can all get as much good food as possible. So I'm going to ask you my favorite random question on this show, which is where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage, or venue? Mm. I, my favorite, it's probably a pretty weak answer, but SoFi Stadium, because I live down in Southern California, and that's the most expensive stadium in the world, like two times over. And $5.5 billion. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. So <laughs> I don't know if you could beat that. That's not like a really creative answer, but man, I, I am blown away when I go there. All right. So we're going to SoFi Stadium. Restaurant Transformation Festival is now, instead of 500 people, 70,000 people <laughs> from all over the globe that are coming for this kind of transformation, for this kind of programming, for keynote conversations, TED style, TEDx style conversations about hospitality. And I'm going to put you on center stage and I'm going to ask you, Tony, can you tell us how do you make data? How do you make numbers come to life? Well, I love numbers. So I'm a numbers guy, but I've come to learn over, over time that your numbers have to tell a story. They have to lead people to action. And unless they do that, they're kind of worth, worthless. So everything that we do in our tool is trying to do that. It's trying to present numbers to restaurants and allow them to make real actionable decisions that make them better. And so, you know, a, a recent book that I read that I love is Making Numbers Count. And this book gives some thoughts around how you can make numbers more useful for people. And it's very simple things that you bring to life. Like a super simple example would be a million and a billion both sound big. But if if you counted a million seconds, it would be 12 days, which is a while. If you counted a billion seconds, it would be 33 years. It's so like that. Wow. So I just love the opportunity to put things like that into perspective. And sometimes that helps us make much wiser decisions. That's amazing. So you came off, you gave the keynote to kick off this festival and you talked about numbers, numbers specifically to Restaurant 365 to give a scope to all the customers that you have, potential customers that you have. And I think it's for me sitting in the audience that now we do use Restaurant 365. We were a proud, proud partner, proud client. Uh, right it on. was very impressive to me to see a leader lead with that transparency. Can you share with the audience about what those numbers were that you presented? Yeah, some of the things we shared today at the conference is it just around how our organization has evolved, right? And so a couple numbers, we're over 100 million in revenue. We have, we're coming up on 800 employees here pretty soon. Impressive. Um, we just raised some funds. Uh, so that, that was great to have a successful fundraise of $135 million. And we believe in advancing our product so much. We invest about $30 million in R&D to develop wow. the product every year. That's impressive. Let's go to the raise. 135 million. You said you could have raised more, but you capped it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm grateful that there were a lot of groups out there that believed in us, but what it really shows me more, they believe in the restaurant industry because I love this industry. And there's some people, when we started in the early days, you got to imagine like in 2011, there were groups when we'd go out and talk to them that would say, 
That sounds like a bad idea. Lots of restaurants <laughs> go out of business, right? And, remember, and so it was really yeah. hard to get believers in some of that. And so that for me, it's not as much just that they believe in me, but that they believe in the whole industry. Like, for example, when we did that, the New York Stock Exchange sent me a picture that they had put up on their floor. Congratulations to Restaurant vision 365. Boarding. I, lo I love yeah. the, <laughs> the, the stock exchange giving a vision board to founders. Right? Like, hey, you see yourself here? You can be ringing the bell. Yeah, it was so creative of them. But the thing I loved about it is like they weren't shying away from the restaurant industry like years ago. I think yeah. a lot of people were. And it just showed that at all walks, people believe in it. Yeah. Do you believe there will be a time that you'll be ringing the bell? You know, it's it's possible. I don't have a set roadmap, but the way I try to lead the business is so that we are capable of a lot of outcomes. And so we're ready. So there's a lot of controls and things we put in place to make sure we're fully a grown up company for whatever comes. I love to talk about the co-founders, Morgan Harris, John Moody. How have they, how has the relationship evolved from this seed of an idea to now as many employees as you have, as much revenue as you're doing, as much as you've raised, and to see how many people are excited about the future of the product? What cool guys. I, I hope you've had a chance to talk with them too. Yes. Morgan and John are fantastic. And the three of us get along so well. And it was a blast from when we started this all the way to now. They're both still engaged in the business fully, which you don't always find at this stage. Yep. And they're they're so helpful and collaborative and the three of us work together. You know, sometimes if I'm speaking, let's say at a university or something, a lot of the things the students want to know is how do you start a business, right? And one of the <laughs> things is you don't want to start it by yourself. It's hard. Some people yeah. do that, but it's hard. So it's great to have folks with you and then they'll say, "Okay, well what do you want out of those people?" And I say uh, the best is if they're people that you already know and have experience with, people who are humble, because there's there's going to be a lot of times along the way where each person thinks their idea is right, right? And you don't want to fracture this relationship. And so you have to find the ways to disagree, but advance things. And And those two guys are guys that totally have those qualities. And I couldn't have started the business with better people. Talk about partnerships. Uh, when we're talking about technology companies, you have so many different partners. I learned you have multiple tiers of partnerships. I had one of your partners on earlier on today, and they said they were one of the first partners. And they remember going to a, a dinner in Vegas, and it was you know a couple of the first four partners that were there. And you guys were so nervous about spending all this money <laughs> yeah. Yeah. at this first Vegas dinner. I'm like, oh, I'm definitely talking to Tony yeah. about that <laughs> because they're spending a significant amount of money here at the JW Marriott. So, yeah. so bring, bring me back to there to where you are now. Oh, yeah. So uh, just a tiny bit on money. We started on our own dime and we ran for seven years that way. So wow. we did seven years before we raised any funds. Now we've done seven fundraisers. But before that, I mean, it was lean times, right? I mean, because <laughs> I didn't have a lot of dimes. So if you're on your dime, then that's it. And so it was pretty exciting early on. I remember the first time we had a marketing budget was about four years into the business. Okay. Before that, we didn't have any. And it was $10,000, right? And for us, it's yeah. like a huge deal. Now it's a little bit different, <laughs> it's right? A little bit bigger, yeah, like yes. the lunch here was probably yeah, yeah. So it's a little different but yeah it's the a dessert blast. was yeah exactly today. um but yeah and and so then thinking about the other side of that question which is the partners we do we have an awesome ecosystem and we've really put a lot of care over these i'd say last five years to really solidifying and growing that out at first it was just partners if we needed to integrate with them they became a partner yeah but over time it became much more deliberate and we have partners in all different avenues so we have point of sale partners we integrate with 115 of them. So amazing. You know, a lot I can't of there's 115 point of sale companies. There's 170, but 170. we've chosen to integrate with 115 wow. of them. Um, there we have uh, hundreds of vendor partners, right? That we're connected with. We have bank partners, and then we have accounting firms that are both customers of ours, but also will partner with us. They'll do onboardings, they'll help their clients to use it. So all kinds of different partnerships these days. And what is the key to successful partnership? For me, it's value on both sides. I mean, that's it. If you can find something where there's value on both sides, it's going to be successful. Otherwise, one group is always just asking the other group for money because that's the only value they get from it. And those don't usually build into a really strong relationship. On stage, you shared that something that you've rolled out recently that's gotten the most traction out of anything you've ever rolled out is intelligence. Mm -hmm. Tell us more. People want to be told more about what's going on, yes, right? And and there's so much going on, especially in the restaurant industry, if you have multiple stores, then 
you you really lose visibility to that unless something's serving it up. And so while we've always had a system where you could run reports and it could give you information, this one is next level insights and being able to see so much in one dashboard that really is a little more actionable and telling you what to do. And, and we've just found that right now the world is ripe for that type of intelligence. When you think about storytelling as a founder, as a CEO, and you think about all the different social platforms and all the different places that your story can be found, how do you prioritize the content that is going up? Because I admire, I'm fortunate with digital hospitality restaurant influencers, I get to meet with a lot of incredible people. Not all of them are willing to share their story the way that you are. You're very active on social media. You're a great follow on LinkedIn. Um, you go on podcasts. You do a lot of the things that we teach other founders to do <laughs> because no one's coming to tell your story. It doesn't matter how great your PR firm is. doesn't matter how great your product is. The, ch the truth is if you build something great, you still need other people out there sharing it, yeah. not just in real life, but also online. How do you prioritize storytelling on, on the internet? For me, uh, I'm, I am not a master of social media, um, but luckily, you know, I've been able to build some uh, presence there because what I do believe in is people knowing you, really knowing you for yeah. who you are, not some fake persona and, and not putting up a big curtain in front of you and hiding what you're doing. So you'll see that I'm pretty forthcoming with numbers of our business and what we're deciding in our business and how we arrived at those decisions and also my background and where I came from. And I just feel like when people know each other, then it's way easier to lean in and find how you can have a relationship together that's that's valuable. And so because of that, since I've always done that in my life, now on the social side, I've tried to foray into doing it there as well. And then part of it in terms of podcasts I'm on and that kind of thing, I have an awesome marketing team that's able to help me make some of those decisions. And because I, I am, I would tell anybody, I am probably the worst marketer. <laughs> and so I, I need a group around that is really knowledgeable telling us where, where we should be going, what we should be doing, and they nail it. If you have any advice to founders or people in the hospitality space that are starting out that are, that are dads, what kind of advice would you give? Oh, man. So I am a father of four daughters. Girl and, dad. Yeah. And so <laughs> girl, let's girl see. Girl dad through and through. Let's see what I could rattle off. Yeah, I am a girl dad. So I, I think I would say, one, if you have kids that get motion sick, carry bags all the time. That's okay. That's the first one. I, I may be speaking from experience. It, you know, it might be hypothetical. Can you, can you share what you told the stage? Oh, Where did you, just went to, you just went to Paris. Okay. Yeah. So my wife grew up in France. Yes. So we went back to visit for her and um, between all the flights and the trains that we had and all of my kids somehow get motion sick, there were 14 vomitings throughout that trip. So pretty <laughs> oh unprecedented. Gosh. Yeah. Unprecedented. When you go, are you able to turn off? Are you go, able to go into airplane mode or do you have to have connection to Wi-Fi to the pulse of the business? Yeah, I, I try to run where I'm still connected to the pulse. I don't ever try to turn everything off because I've been able to strike a pretty good balance of not letting myself get sucked all the way in either. So it's not really a switch on and off. For mm -hmm. me, it's just a little piece of my life that that is always existing. And because of technology these days, you can get a text and respond to a quick text or Slack message or email and still be in the moment. Huge news, Toast, our primary technology partner at our barbecue restaurants in San Diego and the primary technology partner of so many of the guests that we have on this show have announced they are expanding their business offerings with Google. So now if you search on Google Maps and you sign up for Toast Tables or Toast Waitlist, you will have the opportunity to improve the digital hospitality experience of the guest, allow them to book through the maps into the Toast Reservation system. One of the biggest difficulties that restaurant guests have is when they search for your restaurant and they want a table, they do not have an easy solution to book a table or to get on a wait list. This is huge news for the restaurant industry, huge news for guests and huge news for you, the restaurant owner. Check out Toast Tables today and find out the new integrated solution that they have. This is something that we've wanted for a long time. How do you integrate reservations, wait lists into your point of sale? Toast has done it. Check it out. I'm fascinated by growth of technology companies, how you start small. I mean, any organization really you start small and then you grow and you add departments and, you know, you don't want to get to the point where 
you know, people aren't connected where you have a sales side and a marketing side and they don't talk to each other. You know, you want to keep cohesion in this group. How do you grow an organization? You talking about silos, you're nailing something that I think about all the time. Uh, not because we're doing a terrible job at it, but because I think at every stage of growth, you have to be deliberate about avoiding those silos yes. or they're going to creep in. There's been times in our organization where I take my eye a little bit off of that ball and they creep in. And so we're constantly making tweaks. Sometimes that's leadership tweaks where you change the purview of what certain people are over. So it it forces them to be connected to one another. Um, and sometimes you're just doing it through putting some software in place or other mechanisms that help some of these groups to connect. But I'm constantly in that. Do you have any stories of aha moments when you're developing products or trying to bring things on where you're having a conversation with a restaurant group or a restaurant owner and you go, we need to do that. We need to build that. I'll tell, I'll tell you about it. I'll tell you the opposite of that. Okay. I want the opposite. Because, because what I, lessons and stories, yeah, that's because perfect. What I would like to drive is exactly what you said when you're talking with a customer. So my negative one is going to be in the really early days. If you don't talk with a customer because you think you know it all, I apologize <laughs> now. Um, you know, in the first six months, I thought, what would be awesome is for us to build this other module, right? Yes. And, and so we, we were building accounting and then I had this idea to build a marketing piece, yes. right? And marketing can be really powerful for restaurants. Sure. But you have to be really serious about it and really building it out. And, and I was just looking at it as this little side project. And I hadn't interviewed customers about it. I hadn't talked to people. I had just thought it would be great. Yeah. So me and this other two developers, and we set off and we build this thing for like two months. And remember, we're on our own dime. So <laughs> we're, we don't have a lot. And, and we spend two months on this thing and then we take it out there and nobody wanted it. Yeah. I mean, it was worthless. And so we ended up having to scrap it. We tossed it. You know, sometimes you're able to reuse the code in some other way and you have a good story. Like Amazon has one of those, right? With their phone didn't do very well, but they were able to foray what they used on their phone to then go into Amazon Alexa and drive all the success they've had with those devices. So that's a great learning. For me, I took everything we learned in building that marketing tool and then I threw it in the garbage. So sadly, we aren't, we aren't a success story on that piece. But because of that, that helped us know early on, you really need to be broad about who you're learning from and then build to add value not because something seems cool. So that's the main thing I would say on that is always add value. So I, I drive that home to our team. AAV is what I say all the time. What is AAV? Always add value. We say ABB, always be branding. Oh, I like that too. So why, why, is, why is brand? So how do you think about brand as a tech company? Yeah, I, I think a lot of tech companies, just because they're a tech company, have this feel that they're probably hip or, you know, that's probably the worst word. <laughs> the now silly, I'm not hip. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I've, I've, I've exposed myself. That's fine. Yeah. But just tell uh, us a dad joke. <laughs> yeah. Right. I've got plenty of those too. Of those. What has five fingers and isn't your hand? My hand. Uh, okay. So let's keep going here. So I am not hip, but, but yeah, there's a piece of tech companies that just makes them feel a little bit cool. But I do think that the thing that's more important in branding a tech company is two things, growth and learning. I think if you're based in that and you're always growing, and I don't just mean by getting more money from your customers, yes. but I mean growing the product especially, but also growing in employee account, in knowledge, and then learning. If you're always out there trying to learn, I think it denotes a humility, which makes you a lot easier to work with. And if you actually learn, you're that much better next year. And so those are the two things that I think are really important around the brand. Are there any business leaders that you look up to, that you follow, um, things that you like to emulate? Man, there are so many people I've been impressed with. Really, what opened those doors is the first time we took investment, kind of opened this world of other people that I could get introduced to and connected with. And I was really lucky to get connected with a lot of them and, and learned so much. One person I will call by name here is Tui, who's the, pre, the CEO of Procore, super successful vertical SaaS uh, technology company in the construction space. And he has had a lot of valuable advice for me over the years. There have been so many, so I hate to even name a name. But but yeah, I just got off the phone with him from a week ago, so that's freshest in my mind. Do you remember a story that he that he shared with you? Well, you know, at each stage, I'd meet him, and they were about five years ahead of us in the journey. Okay. And so then he'd tell me, you know, something that was a nightmare for him, and then he reshifted his executive team 
uh, you know, so that it would solve something. And, and I'd note that down thinking that's not for us today, but I want to revisit that later. And, and so there's been things like that where I take a ton of notes and then I'll, I'll file them back and then come back later when we're a little larger. What was it I learned again? And, and there's a lot of those you can put to work. I mean, the fact that you talk about that is exactly the reason why I think this event is so powerful is exactly that. You have other restaurant owners, you have other partners that are, we're all in the same play, we're all in the same playground. Yeah. But once you go to the playground, you're willing to play and you're willing to share, hey, I fell down on the swings. Hey, I felt, you know, hey, come try this thing out. This is what I'm doing. Can you talk about why in-person events are something that's important, especially coming out of COVID? Boy, it changed things on us in 2020, right? It changed the whole world. Uh, we've seen that in our own company where post pandemic, we have our offices because we're in seven year leases. So we've made it available for employees to come back, but it's optional. And most of them don't. Yeah. And, and I'm okay with that because there's a lot of productivity and gains from no traffic and yep. things like that and some value and quality of life. So I support all that. But the only part I do get sad about is not getting to know people quite as well in that one-on-one yeah. -on -one personal connection type of way. And I think that some of that really does come best in person. And so an event like this, where we bring in hundreds of customers together, you really can just rub shoulders with someone and swap a quick idea that otherwise they're not going to schedule something on your calendar. It's too formal to do a lot of that. So I love the type of conversations you can have in passing or who you can sit by at lunch. So one of the things we talk about on the show is something my grandfather taught me. The basic principles is to stay curious, to get involved, to ask for help. For me as an entrepreneur, the hardest part was to ask for help. I'm a curious person. That's why I love podcasts. I love reading books. I love going to conferences, getting involved. I have no problem making mistakes and looking stupid, sounding stupid, which is why I'm podcasting. <laughs> this is how we got to where we are now. You but are doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. No, I mean at the podcast. <laughs> Thank no, you. Yeah. Well, you should have seen the early podcasts. They were not good. No one was listening. But uh, we're fortunate now that we have a stage with Entrepreneur and you know we've reached millions of people and we get to interview the greatest minds and thinkers in the, in the hospitality and storytelling space. But when I think about asking Asking for help, I try to internalize why was it so hard for me? Is asking for help hard for you? Oh, it is for sure. Like for uh, here's a great example of it. Um, I didn't have uh, even an executive assistant that might help me with a little bit of calendaring or travel or a chief of staff that would help me with some of running the business and the executive team all the way up through a hundred million in revenue <laughs> where a lot of CEOs do that earlier. Yeah. But it's one of these things where I felt like I'd be giving up something. Yes. I'd be stating to the world that I'm lazy or yes. something, right? And I didn't want to give that up. But then finally, you know, from talking to some of these wise people, yes. like I mentioned before, and they shared with me the benefits. And then I thought, it's really selfish of me not to have a good team that does the things because I actually don't do the things that well. Yes. And there's people that do them better than me. And so that has helped me to ask for help. Another thing that's really helped me is every year I draw a quadrant. And so the quadrant will have love it, don't love it, and then great at it, not great at it. And so I end up with this upper corner that is love it and great at it. And those are, and I put all my job responsibilities into this quadrant and I see which things are really fueling me and really doing well. And then I find the things that I'm not as great at. And I understand I need to ask for help on those things because I'm doing a disservice to the company if I try to do all those. Because I have to be honest and admit, I'm probably not the best person here to do that thing anymore. And, and so that helps me. And then as well as if there's certain things I don't love anymore, then I also have to think about what do I need to change about me to love it? Or what do I need to change about who's doing that and how it's happening so that it's a more effective? Because if you do too many of those things you don't love, that's the burnout zone. That's it's the danger of burning out. Everyone has to do a little bit they don't love. But if you do it for too long, then it really puts you in a tough spot. So some of those things, that exercise really helps me to see where I need to ask for help. What's something in the love it box that you'll never give up? Ooh, I think I will never give up going to lunch with employees. I love connecting one-on-one -on -one and I love eating out. And so you put those <laughs> things together and you're never prying that from my hands. Yeah, it's fantastic. So uh, every single week on Wednesday and on Friday on the social audio app Clubhouse, we meet. So you, the listener, somebody that's listening to the show, if you're watching on YouTube, if you found the content, we want to hear your story about your restaurant. If you're a content creator, if you're in sales, if you're in marketing, if you're a hospitality professional, this is a micro community of digital hospitality leaders. Come on stage, share your story. Um, we also give a social shout out this week. Social shout out is going to Alex Elman, 
who is responsible for helping organize this incredible event. He's part of the Restaurant 365 team. Um, he's been working very hard, and I'm impressed to see him uh, where he is now versus when the first started working with him at the Wiltern in Los Angeles, where he had a lot of things going on, but now the infrastructure is around him to help him do what he does best. But Alex, um, he's also been on Clubhouse. So everything that I've asked of him, he's done that. Um, so this shout out goes to him. Can you give me a shout out? I want you to single somebody out, one person in the organization. From my team? Yeah, from, I, I don't want 800. Team. It's not a team. I need one person from the team today on Entrepreneur that gets a shout out. Okay. One <laughs> shout out today goes out to Mr. Chris Sunberg. Okay. Chris Sunberg is our senior VP of customer success. And I just saw him in action 10 minutes ago. That's why he's on my mind first. Just jumping in with a customer who had... Uh, you know, some some complaint that they they felt they weren't understanding in the system. And Chris didn't just send someone else in, but he just walked in and dove in himself. And by the end of it, they were in a great spot. So I'll shout out Chris because he's always so caring. And I hope that our whole organization uh, replicates that. Awesome. So I'm going to real quickly ask you about smartphone storytelling. Are you an Android user or an iPhone user? Android. Android. Because I have the Galaxy Fold. Okay. And I love the big screen and it has changed my life. Okay, fair yeah. enough. But I don't recommend it to anyone. People always ask me and I say, I love it, but I don't recommend it. And okay. the reason is because it's hefty. And so you have to really be committed to having a brick in your pocket. But if you want one, it is an incredible piece of technology. And I would never get another phone myself. Are you, you prefer text or email? Text. Slack or email? Are you on Slack? Email. I am on Slack. I'd go text, email, Slack. Text, email, Slack. Uh, where do you listen to music? I almost always just listen to books and it's through Audible. Through Audible. Yeah, Fair. if I listen to music, it's Amazon Music. What's your favorite social media platform? LinkedIn. What's your least favorite social media? X. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, there's a lot I don't use, so I guess they'd be my least favorite, but I have not Snapchatted anyone in my okay, life. Okay, so. fair enough. Um, and what is the most useful app that you use on your phone? Maps. Maps. Does Which maps? A Google Maps. Google Maps. That does yeah. definitely counts. Um, and are you more of a photo taker or a video taker? photos, but I'm pretty obsessive about the world has too many photos. So then I will go back through and delete like 90% because I only want the photos everyone should look at 10 years from now. But you don't publish the photos. They just stay on your camera. Uh, yep. They just stay on my camera. <laughs> That's right. I don't share them. Fantastic. Yeah. So I guess it's just your own me. curated yeah. photo list. Yep. That's fantastic. All right. That's Tony Smith. Thank you so much. If you guys want to follow me, it's at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. That's on all the platforms. Uh, we appreciate you for listening to the show. Please check out Restaurant 365. You guys got some upcoming tours. Where are you guys going to be? Ooh, I don't know where we're Chicago going Chicago and New York. Okay, you so know where we're going I know next. where you're going. Thank you're you. going to Chicago and like you're going I to said, New York. And I like have an <laughs> incredible marketing team. <laughs> so they're going to be there. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. But thank you so much for your hospitality. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, please follow Tony on LinkedIn because he's uh, posting some great content. Yeah, congrats on everything you're doing. It's just all top notch. And I really appreciate you spending time with me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Restaurant Influencers. The best way that you can help us with the show is to subscribe and write a review. We love the opportunity to connect with you no matter where you are on the globe, no matter what restaurant you are running. Please send us a DM on social at Sean P. Walchef. If you are interested in toast, if you want to improve your digital hospitality, please send me a DM. I will get you in touch with a local toast representative. We appreciate you listening to this show. The best way that you can help the show is share it with a friend and we will catch you all next week or we will see you on one of the digital playgrounds that we call social media.